Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Sfarim Chatter Podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined once again by Dr. Morris Fairstein, who was previously on the podcast about a year ago or so uh, to discuss his translation and new edition of Tzana And this episode of the podcast, we're going to be discussing another work that he translated from Yiddish. This one is entitled Yiddisher Teriak, an early modern Yiddish defense of Judaism. Uh, was edited and translated with a long introductory uh, essay by, um, from Wayne State University Press. So, first of all, thank you once again, Dr. Fancy, for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me again. It was a pleasure the first time, and hopefully we'll have a nice conversation this time also. Likewise. So, I think we may have discussed this last time, but for people that didn't hear this, or we should just, just you know, rehash this again, you know, why, obviously, this is, you know, like I mentioned, you would translate it Tenorena, which is the classic Yiddish compendium, I guess, on Chumash, let's just call it. And then and then you went and now you translated this, and I think other works, also you're working on other works. Yes, I've so, worked on several other projects. Right. So why, why, I mean, how did you get into translating Yiddish Svarim into English? And I mean, why, why the interest in doing so? Well, uh, first, I guess the most important thing is to mention is that... Uh, I have a very strong background in Yiddish. I'm a native speaker. I grew up speaking Yiddish. Uh, Yiddish was still the language of instruction in the yeshiva I attended, Uh, family, friends, so I'm sort of immersed in in Yiddish. Uh, The the other, uh, but that doesn't explain early Yiddish, that explains modern Yiddish. The the other, among my other interests are uh, what is sometimes called popular religion. Uh, I'm more, it, it's an area that hasn't been explored as much as it should be uh, for various reasons. And it's, it's something that attracted me. I uh, discovered uh, a manuscript when I was in graduate school that I wrote about that was from the 18th century and that got me interested. And then I went off to do other things, Hasidism, Kabbalah, etc. And then at a certain point, I was looking for a new direction. And a good friend of mine, a professor in Israel, we were talking about this. He said to me, you know, you have this talent uh, for Yiddish. And you have certain skills that are very rare in Yiddish. Uh, basically, most scholars of Yiddish come out of sort of secular Yiddish backgrounds. So they know very little about Judaism. And also, uh, when it comes to early Yiddish, you need really three things. You need first, in terms of the language, knowing Yiddish is not enough. You need to also have a reasonably decent command of German. Because early Yiddish is essentially virtually the same language as German with a lot of Hebrew thrown in. Modern Yiddish has Slavicisms, other things. Uh, and the second thing is that most early Yiddish books were written by religious Jews. And you have to, when you read a text, be able to say, oh, that's a Gemara, that's, that, that's a Pasuk. You, you, in other words, you have to be able to understand the religious component. And, and uh, I'll give you one example of that. It's very amusing. Uh, there's a very famous Yiddish book called, called the Shmuel book which was translated in the collection of, there was a fellow called Gerald Frakes, uh, early modern Yiddish epic, translated a number of Yiddish, early Yiddish books. And in the Shmuel book, uh, which he translated, he's not Jewish, had, comes out of the German background of German. He knows German perfectly, but knows nothing about Judaism. So I'll give you one interesting example I came across. He, uh, there's a story in there about King David and Bathsheba. Shmuel book is sort of a paraphrase, a reworking uh, of the book of Shmuel, of the biblical book of Shmuel. It has a story about David and Bathsheba. It's a very strange episode. Uh, And uh, it's very odd when you read it and say, where did this come from? It it seems so bizarre. And uh, he just passes it over. If he says anything about it, it's a folktale. But when I looked at a little bit about it and did a very little bit of research, it turns out that this very bizarre story uh, of how David meets Bathsheba is straight out of the Talmud. It's in Tractate Sanhedrin. And, it's, and you wouldn't believe, you know, it's, 
the dialogue, I'll just very briefly, the, the dialogue goes something like, David says, sees Bathsheba and he calls her and he says to her, I see you've been to the mikveh. And then he says, uh, and you have a get, right? And she says, yes. He says, well, in that case, what's the problem? And this is, this is the Gemara. But you wouldn't believe, I get, just tell, if I told you a story without telling you it's in Sanhedrin, would you believe me that is a Gemara? So this is a more, more extreme example, but there are tons of examples like that. And uh, there, there really aren't, for whatever reason, uh, this area of literature has not been explored. Uh, the few scholars, of, there are very few scholars of early Yiddish to begin with, maybe a handful in the world. And most of them either come out of sort of secular Yiddishist backgrounds or Germans who come at it from sort of German philology, German linguistics. So I come at it from sort of the Jewish angle, which is a little different from what most of the other people do. Very interesting. So let's talk about this book. So first of all, yes. we'll, we'll get to what it means and, and more in depth, but just what is the book? Obviously just for listeners. The right? book is a very interesting book and a unique book. So when people think of Jewish Christian disputations, if you're Jewishly knowledgeable, you think about the Middle Ages, the Ramban, Yechila Paris, all these great rabbis having these grand theological arguments for kings and popes, that's the Middle Ages. Uh, with the coming of print, beginning in the around early 1500s, we find a genre of uh, anti-Jewish books written by two groups of people. One group is uh, Jewish converts to Christianity, who basically write these books in the vernacular, usually in German, uh, not in uh, you know educated Latin because they're ignorant people usually, Jewishly ignorant for the most part also, who write sort of, they're going to expose the secrets of the Jews, you know, all the secret things that, the, the, the terrible things that the Jews do, their anti-Christian beliefs, uh, you know, their rituals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's one group. The other group are, who are interested in Yiddish books, in Yiddish books specifically, a little bit later on, are Christian Hebraists. And they want to learn to read Yiddish because first of all, it's easier than Hebrew. A German, Yiddish and German in say 1500, 1600, if you take out the Hebrew element, the Hebrew words, if a Jew and a Christian met on the street, they would have no problem talking to each other in Germany, in the German speaking lands, not in Eastern Europe, but in Germany. Now, the, the non-Jew would not understand the, the, the like if, if the Jew said uh, tomorrow is Shabbos, the non-Jew would not understand what Shabbos is. He would have to tell him, you know, the German Samstag, the Saturday. At the same time, the Jew in the conversation, if the Christian made some religious reference, something about a church or a Christian holiday, whatever, the Jew would not understand that. But if they're involved, say, in a purely commercial transaction, buying a horse, uh, buying and selling, just talking about the weather, they have no problem communicating. Uh, so the Christian Hebraists, starting really in the sort of middle of the 1500s, were very interested in learning to read Yiddish because they figured this would be an entree to Hebrew. I'll give you a, a very interesting example. The first published Yiddish translation of the Chumash, and this is a book I just finished that is in the press right now in the early modern Yiddish Bible, was published by a famous Christian Hebrew scholar called Paulus Fagius, who had as his uh, co-worker for two years, Eliyahu, the famous Eliyahu Bachur. And Fagius publishes the Chumash in two versions. Same book, two introductions. One introduction is the, uh, for the Jews. What, and what he's 
publishing is what's called the Taich Chumash. Taich Chumash is the way Chumash was taught to children. Uh, it's called also Chumash with Chibur. For example, they add little comments usually from Rashi. Like one, give you an example from my childhood that's to this day stuck with me. When it's talking about Joseph and his brothers, and they throw him in the pit. The, the Chumash says, and the pit was empty. But the way you're taught it in, in, in a Yiddish school, the pit was empty, but it had snakes and scorpions. Yeah. But but so the so these comments are sort of inter, integrated into the text. Or Noyach was, you know, a tzaddik in his generation, these sorts of things. So Fagius publishes uh, two versions. What his real intention is to publish this for Christian Hebraists so they could see how the Jews understand the Bible in order to better, once they understand what the Jews are thinking, they have better strategies to convert them. The problem is there aren't enough Christian Hebraists to make a print run feasible. So what he does is he makes two editions. One has a Jewish cover and introduction where he is not mentioned. And it says, oh, this is good for people who want to teach their children, or if you live in a distant, uh, you're not near a town, you can use it to, which he gets from an early Yiddish book. And then the second one, which has a German introduction, he begins by saying, why am I publishing this garbage? And goes on to explain for 10 pages, well, because it'll help Christian scholars understand how the Jews read the Bible, and then they can then, of course, convert them. They'll understand, you know, knowledge is power, that sort of thing. So uh, th th that's how, that, these are the sort of the two groups, the, the converts and the Christian Hebraists who were interested in Yiddish, uh, because they see it as the entryway to understanding the Jews, and of course, the ultimate goal is always to understand to convert them by understanding what how they think, what, what they believe, what, what their traditions, what their rituals are. The teriyak is, is part of the first category. That is a, a, a convert who uh, what, wants to attack the Jews. So there was a convert to Christianity. We don't know his Hebrew name. Uh, his baptismal name when he became a Christian is uh, Friedrich Samuel Brentz. He publishes a small book in seven chapters in Augsburg in 1614, called in German, it's called the Abgestreifte Jüdische Schlangenball, the stripped off Jewish snakeskin. I'm stripping off the snakeskin of the Jewish snake to reveal the secrets. And it turns out that uh, He's a neighbor of Zalman Svi of Alfenhaus, and they live in the same general region. Zalman Svi uh, sees this book when it was published, gets very angry and starts saying very bad things about this uh, apostate. Who hears about it, and Zalman Svi writes about this. We know nothing about Zalman Svi other than what's in his book, everything, but he has a lot of interesting tidbits aside. So he says, I, I uh, and th this apostate works is in the employ of the Count of Ettingen, who is a major German nobleman in the area. So he's got some clout, some protection behind him. Some, you know, he's not just some guy off the street or in terms of he has connections, he could get a Jew into trouble. So Zalman Svi writes about how he was telling people this, this guy is a bad person, you know, making saying bad things about the book. And this Brenz comes and, and comes to his house and threatens to attack him. And, you know, they, they, they have an altercation. And he gets very angry and he goes off and he spends nine months writing a refutation. Literally, the, the Teriyak is, uh, it's each paragraph starts something like, the Mishumit says X, but I tell you he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then goes on to explain. Now, let me, which leads me to this term teriyak. And what is the connection between teriyak and a snake? So the word teriyak is actually a Greek word, teriyake, uh, which is found in the Talmud in two places, uh, Shabbat 109b and the Dharam 41b. And it means the same thing in Greek as it does in the Talmud. 
The theriac is a remedy for a snake bite. Now you see the connection that he's going to provide the remedy to the snake bite of breads. That's where the name comes from. The theriac is also a very interesting thing uh, in terms of it also becomes the a term for sort of a universal. Let, let me read you a uh, interesting aside, in, uh, which I found in a book on the history, uh, history book. It says in the 16th and 17th century, the term theriake was used for the Galenic universal cure. cure. That's Galen, the ancient uh, physician, you know, the authority of medicine, which enjoyed a wide popularity during this period. And the author writes, all cities with a university or medical college prepared their own theriac, often in a civic public ceremony involving magistrates, physicians, and ecclesiastical dignitaries. And in Venice, the last public ceremony for the making of the theriac was in 1842. So it's an interesting kind of a thing in its own right. So what Zalman Svi does, and Zalman Svi, let me tell you a little about Zalman Svi, because otherwise it'd be hard to understand. Brent's wrote in German. So here should be an immediate major problem. One of the things that the rabbis did, because as I said, German and Yiddish were so close at that time, that if a Jew could read the Latin alphabet, he could understand the German book perfectly well. So there was this great you and cry against what was called galochis, because it was called galochis even earlier, because uh, of course the galoch is the, the Latin and also learn reading was associated with the clergy in the Middle Ages. So that's how it got this term in Yiddish galochis, the the language of of of, of the priests. So it was at least in Germany. It was rare that Jews could, uh, it was unusual for a Jew to be able to read, even interested in reading German or reading the Latin alphabet. In Italy, it was very different. Uh, in Italy, the Italian Jews, there was a, a major Ashkenazi community in the northern Italy in the Veneto area. And they published Yiddish books in the 1500s. It's very interesting that the last Yiddish book published in Italy was around 1600, 1604. And why was that? Because Italian Jews switched their vernacular to Italian. There's tons of you know, popular books written for Jews by Jews in Italian. And one of the things that uh, Zalman Svi tells us, he mentions, is that before this incident, a number of years before that, he'd gotten into some kind of trouble. He doesn't tell you what, but he had to leave home. Could be financial trouble, could be. He had to leave his home area and he spent 10 years in Italy. Which explains, I think, how is it, not only is Zalman Svi, as, as we'll see, able to read a German book, he also, knows quite a bit about Christianity. There are cases in the book where he says, this ignorant Christian does not even know his own Bible. And then he proceeds to quote literally chapter and verse from the New Testament. It says, it says in Luke, whatever, or Matthew, whatever, such and such, which shows that you don't know what you're talking about. Or one of my favorite ones, uh, the, uh, Mishumid, as he calls him, says that when a Jews call a church a tumma, and in Yiddish it's still called a timma, it comes from the word tame, because uh, they consider it impure. So, so Zalman Svi, in one of his sort of interesting twists, says he's an ignoramus, he doesn't know what he's talking about. We all know that in Italy, in Italian, a great church is called a Duomo. And, and he says, what well, we're not calling it a, a Timur, a Tumur. It's He doesn't understand Yiddish even. And what we're calling is like the Italians call it a Duomo. So 
these are examples of, of Zalman Svi's knowledge. I mean, it's, at the same time, I should point out that not only does he know the New Testament, he's also a seriously learned Jew in terms of he can quote rabbinic literature. Again, he just does, doesn't say the Gemara says, he'll tell you exactly where it says. And he's usually quite right, you know, he knows what he's talking about. So he's an interesting, uh, unusual personality. So what he, he is what we would call, there's another group of people that need more study, what they call the secondary elite or the secondary intelligentsia. You know, not the great genius rabbis, the ones who everybody knows about, but sort of the rabbis of small communities, uh, what we call clay kodesh, you know, religious functionaries. In fact, he himself mentions that he was a moil. He mentions it in the, in the context of, in one place, he says the, the Mishumid, again, the, the apostate, says that there's a Jewish tradition that every mohel has to circumcise a number of boys equivalent to the gematria of his name. And he says, my Hebrew name is Shlomo, which means I would have to circumcise 365 boys. I think 365 is Shlomo, if I remember correctly. And... Uh, is that right? Shin Lama. 375, not 375. 75, sorry. 375. 375. But so he says, so you tell me I have to go circumcise 375 boys or I won't get into heaven. So, so these are the ways we know about who uh, Zalman Svi was by these little asides and these little references. Let me also jump in. What year are we talking? Do we know when he, when, when, when are we talking? Here's okay. One. We don't know when he lived. Well, we know the Schlangenbach was published in Augsburg in 1614. Uh, the Teriak, the first edition, was Hanau 1650. There's also an interesting story related to that. Hanau at that, Jews could not print in, in Frankfurt. Hanau's right outside of Frankfurt. Jews could not print in Frankfurt, so they, they went to the Duke of Hanau and convinced him to establish a press in Hanau. And the Duke, being a good Christian, hired a Christian scholar to be the censor. Before any book was published, he had to review it. And, and it was very interesting. If a book had been published earlier, he just looked at it, make sure it didn't have anything unusual about it. It went through. If it was a new book, he had to write a report. Why should this book should be published? And the Teriak was, of course, a new book. So he wrote a report. And it's very interesting. Why would it? Why would it? Why would he publish this book, which is anti-Christian in a sense? Again, for the same reason, he says, "Ah, now we can see how a Jew responds to what a Christian says, and we can then take that and again use it for our ammunition to understand how the Jews think." And that's how it was published originally. Uh, the further publication history is also interesting, and and plays even further into that. It was published two more times in uh, the 17th century. In Altdorf, which is a university town right outside of Nuremberg in 1680, where they published both books together. The, the, each one in its own original format. The, the Schlangenbalg in its original German and the Teriak in, in the same exact format as it been published in Hanau. Almost like a photocopy. But the most interesting edition was the year later in Nuremberg. There was a professor in Nuremberg, a theologian called Johannes Wolfers. He published a book which contained the Schlangenbalg in the original, the Teriak in the original, and then a 300 page commentary in Latin explaining why the Schlangenbalg was right and the Teriak was wrong. Then it gets republished in Hebrew, sort of a paraphrase, in Amsterdam, uh, and, then, and then reprinted again. The, the Amsterdam reprint edition is then reprinted in the uh, 19th century. And lastly, and very interestingly, one of the most famous anti-Jewish books uh, called Endectus Judentums, Judaism Revealed, by Johannes Eisenmenger. 
famous uh, scholar and anti-Semite, published in the beginning of the 18th century. It's a thousand page book, but he devotes over 50 pages to Rabbi Zalman Svi and his book. Again, refuting, trying to refute his art anti-Christian arguments. So the book does have a certain history, uh, a certain significance, certainly in the early in the modern early modern period, up to up to about uh, the early 1700s. I mean, so who who was the uh, still a couple of things to to yes, start sure. up to pick up on, but. I think who as who was the intended audience? It seems like here a lot of Christians picked up on it to refute on it. What yeah. did Zalman Tzvi intend this for Jews from people to pick up and to be able to refute, or was yes. he just trying to refute it? He didn't care about who the audience was. Well, I don't. He doesn't tell us. I mean, part of it was because it was a very personal kind of a thing. I, so the question is, was he looking to? since they were both in the same region, contemporaneously at the same time, maybe what he was trying to do, though he doesn't say specifically, is to provide something to the Jews of his region, of his area. Because this other book had been written attacking the Jews, so he wanted to give the Jews, as, as he says, an antidote to the snake bite of, of, of the Mishumet. So his original audience may well have been sort of his community, his his region, the Jews of of that part of Germany. But the, that would seem to make sense, though he doesn't specifically tell us who his audience, intended audience. But that would be the obvious, but by the name and everything else about it, the fact that he specifically, met, you know, he doesn't write a general book about, you know, what Jews, Goyim, what apostates claim by Jews says, but he takes the, the Schlangenbach and literally takes, you, you can line up the two books and if I have an appendix where I list all the accusations in each chapter, and you can find where each one of them ch- accusation, paragraph by paragraph uh, Zalman Svi responds and always begins, Meshumid says Ap- Amaris says and then he explains why he's, he says X, and I tell you he doesn't know what he's talking about, and here's the real answer. So it was probably a, originally for a local audience, but it but apparently attracted attention among Christian scholars also. How unique was this? I mean, how novel was this that A, that he wrote a, just in general, a book refuting what the Mishumid wrote, and mm-hmm. B, that that was in German and this was Yiddish. I mean, you already said that really not many people knew German, so in order to do this, but I mean, it just, I, I guess, take it even further. I mean, how unique was yeah, this? No, the Jews, might not have, the Jews might not have been able to read the German, but at the same time, they're German Christian neighbors. Because all this is written in the same general part of Germany. So the Christian, their Christian neighbors may have read about it or heard about it secondhand, or, or maybe somebody in the church or whatever in the community say, oh, you know, I read this book and it says this and this is about the Jews. So, and, and uh, if a Christian comes over to you and says, you know, what about you, you call a church a toma? Something is impure. So, so, so the idea is that Zalman Tzvi has gives the Jews something an answer to the uh, to the specific accusations that they might face. I mean, and, and you said this was written in the 17th century. I mean, at that at that time, was this normal to write a say a, a work refuting, you know? No, no. You know, accusations. As a matter of that. fact, as far as I know, I mean, there there were tons of work on the Christian side. In other words, me, almost every Christian Hebraist. Uh, would write some sort of a book uh, explaining Judaism in a way of, you know, so you can then attack it, things like that. So the the literature about Judaism from the Christian side is vast. And there's a whole body of scholarship all about it. There, there's even a book written by a professor at the Hebrew University about Christian scholars <laughs> who wrote about and wrote books in Yiddish, trying to convert the Jews. Even some of them did that. But from the Jewish side, to the best of my knowledge, 
I've never found another book of that period, of the early modern period, that specifically attempts to refute the Jews. Basically, my impression is they sort of either weren't aware of a lot of the stuff, because a lot of these books were written, the ones that were written in German about, yeah, were written for scholars, written in Latin and other things. There's one other book that from the other side that may be of interest. There's a, there was a Jesuit priest called Franciscus Hasselbauer in Prague, middle of the 18th century. He, I think he may even become bishop eventually. He's a Jesuit. And he was also, he was the censor of Hebrew books and all kinds of other things. And he was also very interested in converting the Jews. He published an interesting book. And that also, I think it's a unique book as far as I know. It has on two sides. One side is Yiddish, one side is German. And it's a book about Christianity. The concept of that book was that a, a priest would sit together with a Jew. They'd both look at the same book. The Jew would read the, the Yiddish side, which would explain to him why he should become a Christian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The German part, which he assumed the Jew could not read, would tell the priest, at this point, be sure to emphasize, he's reading this, you should emphasize that point from, you know, like a manual, but, but the concept was that the, the Jew and the Christian sit together, theoretically reading the same thing, but technically, actually, the, the, the Christian had sort of notes and instructions and and was a way of trying to convert the Jews. That's, that's also a unique book that I'm aware of, of that period. But that's about the only other thing I could think of being comes close to this, because the, the Christian Hebraist books were, I mean, they were written, just printed so that Jew and distributed to Jews. Uh, for example, in the early 18th century in Germany, there was a movement called the Pietists. Uh, and they were very much into what, converting the Jews. And they published a number of things in Yiddish. And they would also sort of like missionaries go around to, to Jews and give them these books for free. New Testaments, uh, books of, you know, Christian beliefs. So, so that was, but, but that was also a one-way street for the most part. Now, getting back to, to, to Brent's book on the other side, the book that yeah. Teriak is refuting. Interestingly, is his book, was there anything unique about his book? Or you mentioned there are there were a number of other anti-Jewish books written. Or and so what I just want to emphasize, so was there nothing particularly unique about his book? Was it just like you mentioned earlier that either he knew Zalman Seed knew him personally or it was the same area? So let's call it, you know, not as personal, but somewhat personal? Or was there something unique about his book? It was just regular run of the mill. There was nothing interesting in there, really. Uh, well, in terms of his ideas were not that unusual. There is a whole literature uh, of Jewish converts to Christianity starting around 1500. Uh, the most earliest, earliest one was Johannes Pfefferkorn who was a butcher by profession, who, who uh, converted to Catholicism, and then wrote a number of pamphlets. And in fact, it's very interesting, he was not responded to by any Jews, but there was a famous Christian Hebrews, Hebraist scholar called Johannes Reuchlin, who wrote several books attacking uh, Pfefferkorn, and the Dominicans who sponsored him as a whole major controversy, it got all the way up to the Holy Roman Emperor. The, the argument between Reuchlin and Pfefferkorn, but that was sort of on a different level, on different, uh, where Pfefferkorn had basically the Catholic Church supporting him. Reuchlin was, was still a Catholic, but was sort of moving in the Protestant direction. And, and but that was a different kind of a thing. It, I want, to jump in. I want to jump in one second. Yeah. Reuchlin is, is, is famously, he learned, he studied with the Sparno. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Now, Reuchlin was a very interesting character. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and in fact, he, 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 it was very interesting. If you read, he was, one of the problems that Christian Hebraist scholars always had, 
and Reuchlin was a classic example of this. They always had to defend why are they interested in this Jewish stuff and Hebrew? Are you trying to convert to Judaism? Their, their, their faith was always called into question. And even Reichlin had to defend himself that he was a good Christian, that he's doing this to, to, to explain to Christians you know, how to convert to Jews. It always came down to, I'm doing it as a way of learning about the Jews so I can bring them to the true religion. And it's a matter of education, not a matter of that I have any personal interest in this stuff. That's why, for example, I mentioned about uh, Fagius, who is a great uh, Hebraist. I mean, he writes, uh, El Eliyahu Bachur writes about him. You know the famous line, Moshe and Moshe. So, so Eliyahu Bachur writes this thing about him, says, from Paulus to Paulus, there has been no Paulus like Paulus Fagius. Really? This is how, you know, what respect he had for him and how well they got along. But yet, when he writes the edition for the Christians, he has to always say, why am I writing this garbage? What, what, why, why am I wasting my time? He has to defend himself that there's a higher purpose to this, which is, of course, always the purpose of converting the Jews. Right. Okay, so now now I start going back to the, you talk about the other ones, but after uh... After yeah. the recording, we're going to mention the other works that came up until Brent's, up until his work. Yes. Yeah, so the, the other one that's worth mentioning, and this is an important point, is a book by a fellow called Antonio Margarita. Uh, it's called in German, Das ganz Jüdisches Glaube, The Whole Jewish Religion, published in 1530. This book to me is important for the following reason. It was very popular, widely reprinted. And Margarita had a very interesting yichus. His father was the rabbi of Regensburg and his brother was the chazan of Regensburg. So, that, so it was always assumed by, mo, by most of the Christian scholars, even some Jewish scholars, that Margarita must have been, you know, he came from an elite rabbinic family, that he must have been very knowledgeable. And yet, in the course of my research, I came across a very interesting uh, reference in an article by a British scholar who pointed out a dissertation that was done in 1915 in Vienna by a Jewish scholar who, uh, I think his name was Mises, Joseph Mises, perhaps, who wrote about Margarita's uh, Ganz Jüdische Glaube. And basically what... Mises showed that contrary to popular belief, Margarita was a complete Amaris. That when he writes about Judaism, he doesn't know what he's talking about. When he translates, he has, for example, translations of the prayer book in his book, of certain major prayers. He says this guy doesn't know Hebrew. He doesn't, it's, 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 his translations are terrible. But yet, and this is something that is a lacuna in, in the field. When people write about these, you know, these Mishumadim and, 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 and this whole thing, nobody ever seems to ask the question, you know, whether for good or for bad, but is it accurate what is being said here? And like most Christian scholars write about Christian Hebraism and such, Margarita is like sort of, well, he's the great authority. He must know what he's talking about. But when somebody knows something, looked at it, said he doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and Pfefferkorn, in the same way, doesn't know what he's talking about. Most, most of these, uh, it's not like the Middle Ages where you had great rabbis. In Italy, you had, you know, famous rabbis who became Christians and, you know, in public work with Bumberg. And these people are a different world. These are not the, the great scholars who decide to become Christians for, for financial reasons or Usually these converts are sort of people of the middle, lower classes who, whatever reason, you know, decide to convert. But but it's not out of sort of, uh, they're not, don't think they're the guys in, in, in Italy working with Bomberg in Venice. Not that level at all. And I think it's important to be aware of that, that, you know. Right. Okay, so then we got to, you, you mentioned Brent and his book, you know, so the ideas were, 
kind of similar, not, I guess, massively unique. Yeah. So, um, okay. So then we get, then we get to that. Then you have anything more you want to say about his, his work before we get back to the Terry act? About who? About Brent's? Yeah. Or there's nothing really more to say about his work. There's nothing more to say really, because it's just, he makes up a lot of stuff and then, you know, a lot of fantasies and this and that. And the Teriyak basically sort of tries to knock it down literally paragraph by paragraph. So, and uh, yeah, so, so I believe, I think I mentioned, but let me just add that Zalman Svi is unusual in that he's a German Jew who spends time in Italy. And where does he learn the New, New Testament? And where does he learn how to read German? Well, could only be, it couldn't be in Germany, but in Italy it was not unusual. So that's probably where he gets all this knowledge that he seems to have about Christianity and, and other things like that. Right. Um, okay. I mean, so, I mean, you mentioned a couple of examples from the uh, Tariac. I mean, perhaps you have some others that are interesting. A, 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 some others, and I guess I should kind of back up before this, is also you should explain what's the structure of the book, like each chapter, parak, whatever you want to call it. I mean, what does he go through structurally from beginning to end of the book? And, you know, speak out some okay, examples. So the structure follows literally uh, the, the, the Schlangenbau, Brentz's book, is seven chapters. And each chapter has a different theme. And each theme, uh, Brentz has like a statement. The Jews... Here, yeah, for example, uh, I can read you. Uh, here's a good one. The apostate writes in his book, Schlangenbach, that we call Christ Jesus the Nazarene. This is spiteful, and we leave out the best letter that is the ayat. In other words, Yeshu versus Yeshua. So, so that's what Brent says. So in response, he says, I say that all the scholars of the Hebrew language should know if this is a contemptible thing, that they call him Yeshu rather than Yeshua. He says, Jesus of Nazarene is a name that Christians themselves give him. Nazareth is the name of the city where his parents were born. However, in the Hebrew language, Notsri, Nazarene, can be translated as guard or watchman. As the verse says in Jeremiah, the day when watchmen shall proclaim, come, let us go up. This means the day that the watchman will call, come, let us go up, etc. So he shows that, you know, first of all, what are you complaining about? You know, but, but he quotes Isaiah, he quotes, uh, let me find one where he, where he quotes the New Testament. Uh, let's see if I can find one that has. Okay, so here's an interesting example, a very famous one. Uh, there's a concept which some modern Jews may not be familiar with, what traditional Jews are, it's called Nittelnacht, Christmas Eve. Nittel comes from Natali, the birth of. of uh, of Jesus, and Jews are not supposed to study Torah on that night, and there are famous pictures of rabbis playing chess. But there's also a uh, earlier tradition about that, uh, that Jews do strange things on Christmas Eve. So here's an interesting one where he says, the apostate writes here, we Jews eat garlic on Christmas night to disgrace Yeshua the Nazarene, and he says a foolish thing that we Jews say he must crawl out of all the corners, out of the mouse holes on this night. If we were to study Torah, then he would rest. Therefore, we do not study, study, but instead play, eat, and drink to excess. And Mark Shapiro has a whole very interesting article about the history of this concept. That if anybody's interested in the fuller thing, he, his article is very good on that. It says, first concerning garlic, I say we've inherited this from our ancestors. They also gladly ate it, as in Numbers 11. Remember the fish? We remember the fish that we see in Egypt, the cucumbers, leeks, the onions, the garlic. The Germans do not have a taste for garlic, so they made a discovery that we eat it. 
It's the same when we have a holiday or when the Christians have a holiday. We don't come to the Christians and deal with them. It might happen somebody eats garlic on Christmas Eve. Since the Christians, since the Christians celebrate for several days, do not deal with us. However, this is not because we want to do it because of Yeshua and Nazarene. Who would believe such foolishness? Germans don't like garlic, so we don't eat it. We only eat it when they're not around, when you know we're not dealing with them. And then he has another thing about uh, garlic is healthy. He says, clear garlic is considered healthy to eat according to our Talmud. And he quotes uh, from Baba Kama 82a, garlic is healthy for five things. We Jews who wander and do not eat warm foods and drink out of all the pools, garlic is healthy for this. And then he quotes Johannes Buxdorf, the famous professor in his Judenschule, which is interesting. Uh, Buxdorf was one of the ma- most famous uh, Christian Hebraists. And uh, he writes, uh, he quotes Buxdorf explicitly. Uh, and and uh, it's interesting that he knows that Buxdorf exists and that what Buxdorf wrote. Uh, uh, there, there's all kinds of uh, they, uh, then about the to- Tola, about you know Jesus the hanged one. That's always an important one. And he, and he gives a whole, uh, he also explains in his introduction why he, uh, did, you know, about his biography and other stuff. Well, I'll point out, I'll point out uh, for the listeners that interestingly about the book is that, uh, like I said, it's broken down into seven chapters. And in each chapter, there's, you know, separate uh, p- uh, parts of the chapter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, et cetera. Yeah. And in each one, nicely in this new edition that you and your English edition they translate, there's um, little, you know, short, um, what do you call them on the side? Yeah, well, the there's interesting little... thing is the, these short little things on the side, these little sort of markers, brief descriptions, they are found in the original book, in the original Yish edition. There's in the beginning of the book a, a photograph of a page. And where it is exactly like a frontispiece from from the teriyak and if you, i think it's after the introduction i believe at the beginning of the text yes it's it's it, it's page 33 on your in your copy just before page 33 uh you'll see that it's in the original yiddish like that these little comments and wayne state to their great credit when I showed them what the original book looked like, they agreed to reproduce it. Right. And it, it, exactly it, as uh, it was in the original. So, so these things, comments on the side are not, uh, are not uh, something new. They're, they're in the original text. Oh, here's a good one. I just found while we were talking. The apostate from Ettingen writes in the beginning of his chapter that we call Christ the Tola. This means someone hanged, like any other evildoer. Concer- concerning this, I say, a man in the world who understands the holy tongue should come and translate the word Tola. The ignoramus writes Tola with an iron at the end. This is a worm or the color scarlet. And then he has another interesting one. Judges, he quotes Judges 10. Tola, the son of Pua, was a judge in Israel. If Tola had meant hanged man, would you Sachar have named his son one who was hanged? Similarly, the judge in Israel. I write this only so that the apostate stupidity can be recognized. Page 43, if you're looking at the book. Uh, and he has a whole bunch of other... Uh, things about Jesus being hanged. Uh, He points out that the Christians themselves say that Jesus was crucified. But uh, that does not uh, mean anything necessary evil. He talks, he quotes from Samuel, the seven innocent children of King Saul, who were hanged because of the Gibeonites. Uh, 
And I want to just I want to just jump back for a second, yes. for listeners, to emphasize what I mean by that. The little things on the side. I'm just reading here from chapter four. Anywhere the yeah, apostate, yeah. you know, ten. The apostate says that no Jew goes out of the house of a Christian without having stolen. That's just the right. side note telling you what it's talking about inside. Right. It's just like a headline. Right. The apostate writes that the Talmud teaches us to take away the Christian's luck. And the next one, the apostate writes that no Gentile is acceptable to us as a witness. And then that one's broken down at a certain point. He says, depends what. And then responds of Rabbi Jacob Weil, section 147. That's the Murray Weil. So this is yeah. really yeah. nice. You can just flip through the work. He's a look. very learned person. He knows all these, not just Jewish books, but he knows books of the Judenschule, which is only published in 1603. So uh, uh, yeah. I, 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 I want to point out one more thing while you're saying that about the sources that you didn't mention. I think you should mention is that you mentioned the introduction is that he quotes Josephus a lot, but not as you have show that not Josephus, which are most to have. He he clearly knew Josephus as well. Yes. Josephus. Yes, yes, the original Josephus. Absolutely, uh, there there are a number. I have a, a uh, appendix. There are so many quotations from Josephus that uh, I uh, made a special appendix of them. There's several pages worth. And I checked them against the Sefer Yossipan, the, the medieval Jewish thing. And these, are, these quotations are clearly, the only question in my mind is, did he use a German edition of Josephus or an Italian one? But it's clearly the Josephus. It's not Yossipan. It's not the medieval Jewish uh, thing. Absolutely. Which again, another example of his uh, erudition. Okay, so now, now I guess which, which brings us to now the question of, I mean, why did you decide to translate this work? Why did you decide now? You were, you were mentioning in the beginning why you were translating and yes. publishing Yiddish works. Why? What, why why this one is supposed to something else. Yes. Okay, so part of the problem until very recently, early Yiddish books, for the most part, this one in, partic- this one in particular, there are more copies around and available, even when I st- started 10 years ago, than many other books. Many of these early Yiddish books uh, are very rare. There'll be sometimes one or two copies in the world. So the problem is, or was until very recently, how do you get a copy? So it happens that the first two books I did was the Tzen and, and then this, because they were available. Hanush Maruk, the for, late professor of Yiddish at the Hebrew University, did a project in the 1970s the greatest collection of Yiddish book, early Yiddish books is the Oppenheim collection. 90% of the rare Yiddish books are, come from there. So he did in the 1970s, a, uh, the technology of the day was microfish. I don't know if you've ever seen a microfish. It's, it's a uh, sheet of film about the size of an index card, a four by six index card. And they photograph the pages and they reduce them to like postage stamp size, then you have a special reader to blow them up to read them. So on one sheet, four by six, you can have 96 pages of text. 1970s, this was technology. So uh, they did a bunch of books and I, and I bought some of them. They were available for sale uh, somewhere in the early 80s. And so I started with books I had. Uh, so the first book was Tzad Naren. That was ob- obviously uh, probably the single most important early Yiddish book. And uh, then the Teriyak, aside from it being an interesting book, I had access on Google Books and, and things like that to all these editions. So I was able to actually see them. In recent years, uh, a lot of libraries are digitizing books. Uh, for, for Yiddish, two of the big ones are the National Library in Jerusalem. And Frankfurt University in uh, Frankfurt, Germany ha- has a huge, over 300 works in Yiddish, many early ones. And uh, so today it's a lot easier to uh, find sort of rare and unusual things that 20 years ago, unless you went to the library 
you know, you had to basically have a grant for somebody or you had money to go to the library and then you'd have to pay for the reproduction. You know, they have to especially photograph. It's a whole much more complicated affair. In recent years, it's become much, uh, much easier, much simpler. So, uh, so what I'm doing, so the books that I'm doing essentially started out first being things that I was able to have access to. And more recently, I've done things that are interested me uh, uh, and also are available. Things I come across, uh, digitized copies, uh, things like that. For example, I just finished a book, which is in print on the early modern Yiddish Bible, basically trying to look at every Yiddish book from the beginning, first Yiddish book, 1534, to the end of the 17th century, and to sort of do a history of the book, sort of an introduction, uh, like a first scan of what's out there. 20 years ago, I couldn't have done it unless I, I had you know, the money to spend six months in Oxford and six months in Jerusalem. But today, I was able to find most of those books, one form or another, online. So, so that influences me also, what's available. And ultimately, it's what interests me. And what interests me primarily is you know, the majority of these books are religious books. So um, there's a handful of sort of novels and, and poetry. That stuff doesn't interest me at all. There's other people interested in that. So it's just a matter of what interests me. Uh, or, and the other thing is, it interests me and also is it important? Uh, for example, I just finished a book called The Branch People. Uh, which is an extremely important book. It's a Musser book, sort of, you know, practice uh, do's and don'ts, but it's not your classic Musser book that's a reprint of some, one of the, you know, uh, one of the uh, Shari Chuba, whatever, one of the medieval classics. It's a completely original book written by a Jew in Prague, first published in 1596. And he's talking about the things he talks about are the reality of his day. He talks about sort of Jewish life and Jewish practices. And for example, he talks about uh, servants, you know, Jewish servants don't don't have a non-Jewish cook because she won't be concerned about kosher. So it's also a historical source. That's the other criterion I have. It's not just sort of abstract theory. It's, it's also is sources that are important for understanding the contemporary history of uh, early modern Jewry, which I think is a, a particularly popular Jewry, which is something I think has been sort of neglected. Once you mentioned your future projects, let me ask you about that. and then we'll, I'll get back to our final question about the Terry. Sure. So um, first of all, you mentioned the book on the early Yiddish Bibles in yes. print. When do you know when that will be uh, published? Oh, it's an interesting question. It's in. It's been accepted for publication. It's in print. Now, in print, I'll tell you an interesting story. I had an article just published, and uh, the print, the, literally the physical printing of the journal, was delayed for four months because the editor said the printer could not get paper. So. The, the other problem is the press, it's Hebrew Union College Press, which is a very interesting press. They publish interesting things that you wouldn't think of, you know, Hebrew Union College publishing. Uh, it's a small press, very good press, they have some interesting things. But the problem is they publish, they, they have one editor. So it's a question of how much can one person do. So I guess I have to take a, a number and stand in line till the editor gets to my book. Hopefully it'll be soon, but one never knows with these things. Now, what about the, you mentioned the, the Braunschweigel, is that being published as, a, as another book? The Braunschweigel, that's, uh, the manuscript is finished and it's being reviewed by a press. You know how the process works of, you know, you send it in, first you say a proposal. So it's at the stage where I send them a proposal I said, yes, it looks very interesting. We want to see the whole manuscript. 
And then we have to review it and look at it and get opinions. And so that's where the stage that's at. And one never knows. These things can, I had a very strange experience, for example, with the Yiddish Bible book. I offered it to another press that was publishing an encyclopedia about the reception of the Bible. And they had a monograph series. And it sounded exactly like the sort of thing they'd be interested in. And first, they, I send them the thing, the proposal, and say, oh, yes, it's wonderful. We love it. Send us the manuscript. Fifteen months go by. I don't hear a thing. Finally, I say, no. Can you at least? Yeah. I don't care what the answer is, but I want after 15 months. I'd like an answer. Even if it's no, it's better than nothing. And the answer was, we changed our mind with no reason, no nothing. So this is the world of publishing. So until you have a contract from a publisher, you never know what will be. Okay, so we definitely wish you luck on that. And now Thank what's you. with, are you now working on anything else uh, on, the, and on the next project? Uh, I have two, well, I'm working on several articles that are interesting. That uh, One of them will, is already in the press. The other one, hopefully, uh, will be finished very shortly. Yiddish uh, paraphrases of Kabbalistic works. I'll give you, tell you about the one that's in the press. Uh, Moshe de Leon published a book called Nefesh HaChachma in 1608 in Basel. Or it, he, the, it's by de Leon. De Leon did not publish it. A Jew called Abraham of Bunzlau published it. And it's a book with two parts. It's one of De Leon's Hebrew works. For those who know about Kabbalah, will be familiar with it. Uh, the first half is called Said HaNeshama, The Secret of the Soul, the esoteric interpretation of the soul. The second half is Kabbalistic uh, interpretations of commandments. A year after Bunzlau publishes the Hebrew book, he comes back to the same publisher and publishes a Yiddish paraphrase of the first half of the book. Very strange, very interesting. So that, uh, I translated it, ed- you know, explained it all. And, and that's, be- that's one example of the sort of thing I'm doing. Uh, and then the other thing I'm doing, we're in the middle of, completely unrelated to Yiddish. It goes back to my work on Chaim Vital. I, for a long time, I've been very unhappy with the concept of the Dibbuk and how it's been understood. So I'm trying to reinterpret, re-explain completely differently from basically a completely new interpretation of what the Dibbuk is about, how the concept evolves, where it comes from, uh, etc. Okay, interesting. So just to finish up, Back to the, what the main topic of conversation here was, yeah. is that, uh, for, first of all, I'll just mention right away that I will put a link below in the show's notes for uh, listeners to, to find the, the book, a copy of the yeah. Yudin Yes. Um, but just to ask you, I mean, what, what can someone, I guess, you know, what, what is to be gained from, from, from reading the book for, a, for somebody? Is it just historically? Historically, it's very interesting as published, or is there something more in there? Well, it depends on what one's interests are. I mean, if one is interested in sort of Jewish culture in early modern Germany, uh, it would be certainly interesting. Uh, if one's interested in the history of Christian Jewish debates and, you know, polemics, it's a very unusual, interesting polemical work. Uh, or it just might be interesting to see some of how did a Jew in, you know, 400 years ago deal with, with uh, when Judaism was being attacked and then, People saying bad things about Jews. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of a lot of that. Like a lot of very interesting, and, and some of the, some of the stuff is it, it, some of his interpretations are so, like the one about Tuma and Duomo. I mean, it, it, they're almost hilarious. Or the one about Tola being you know, scarlet, and so there's also a lot of amusing things in there too. Creative, very creative sometimes. Right. Interesting creative interpretations. Interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, with that, thank you once again um, for joining me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. And hopefully uh, 
uh, our discussion and also the book will be of interest uh, to uh, your listeners and uh, people who are interested in these subjects. Yeah.